wild, wild playoff weekend slaw. Wild. Craziness going we, on out there. We had for four games, 15 points was the margin for four games. Three, 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 and six. Yeah. It, it was it was a weekend like I've never experienced. I really believe like this was I feel like the rest of the playoffs is going to be a letdown. Without a doubt. I mean, every game, three of them were an OT. Everyone went to the last second. It was the first time I was watching football where I was like, this is absolutely amazing. I was exhausted by the end of the Chiefs game. Exhausted. Yeah. I am right there with you. Um, Man, I I was so disappointed in so much football. Um, Oh, my gosh. Yes. Uh, I mean, I will say it was great to see. No, yes. The competitiveness. One score, score games. Loved it. Uh, Huge, huge entertainment factor. But, uh, man, did every team leave their offensive line at home? They did. They they signed a bunch of practice squad tight ends, elevated them, and said, you're the offensive line. And with that, you're not even going to know the line calls. Just try to block someone in front of you. It oh was God. We got the bro, Bengals here. Yes. I was going to say, let's nine, start with the sacks. Bengals Titans. Nine sacks, guys. I mean, I mean, cre- credit to them. Credit to, to Zach Taylor and joe burrow for for figuring it out um for having a plan because uh, they know their offensive line is ter- terrible but how do you expect to have a shot with an offensive line like that how does nobody address that throughout the year i mean it is it is embarrassing i mean i know they do have a shot but I mean, if they expect to put up a performance like that on the offensive line against the Chiefs ne- next week in the AFC Championship, a disaster. Goodbye. Well, because the Titans, for some reason, they couldn't do anything about it, right? Like once they got the ball, like they they were in control. Like, sure, whatever. Since he did this, and since he tried to lose, let's just be fair. Since he tried to lose. They, they did their yeah, absolute but Ryan, best. Brian Tannehill was trying harder. No I, no, I agree. But they were up 16 to six, had a pick, took it to the 40 yard line. And then they had a dumb celebration penalty that put them back. And that was when the Titans got back right in the game. I, 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 the whole time I was like, that's the dumbest penalty. I go, that's why the Bengals have been the Bengals. And I honestly thought the tight and the Titans should have won with what what went on right like they made some dumb mistakes the Bengals did but then we found out the titans were dumber it was dumb and dumber three is what it was the game on on saturday like what like there was some bad and and the thing is slaw it wasn't all Tannehill's fault like one of the picks like it was a read option and the guy tipped it, jumped up and he had to throw it. It was the decision he was supposed to make. It was one of those RPOs that Mm -hmm. people are getting made fame, made famous for. And the guy made a great play. And there are a couple other things that you're just kind of like, uh, yeah, that, that, that play by the safety to, uh, tip it, tip it to himself. It was dumb. Uh, like that was really good. Now I know as as a quarterback you have to have confidence to be able to beat beat that guy with the ball, but I also feel like like you're looking at that going he's right there I should probably not throw this no or but th- that was a read option extra. but th- th- it was RPO and it was kind of set up because he was going to tackle the running back but then right when he s- started to throw you're not supposed to jump usually as a as a defender, mm-hmm. like you're supposed to just run with your hands up. He timed it perfectly and yeah, he did. somehow, awesome. somehow did what he, that's why sometimes with the, 
I don't know. You have to throw through a guy like that's that's not super incredible high percentage, but whatever. Yeah, but if you're gonna do it, then then either well, you have throw to do a it. Freaking laser beam, uh, so you beat the guy there, or 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 give it a little touch, float it over top. Uh, now now look, I'm I'm blaming Tannehill for it because because he's the one that threw the interception. But in all reality, I know uh, the quarterback's job, you're making throws where the margin for error is an, is an inch here, an inch there. So what they're able to do with the ball is pretty incredible. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to be able to cl- complete that one. I think it should have just been like an incompletion. Find a way to get it incomplete. Yeah, throw away something. I don't know. Uh, but there was a couple other picks in there that's just like, wow. Okay, so. For sure. Oh, Tannehill's just out on this. Um, but I, I think I think some people overreacted because no one, no one, no one will blame Derrick Henry. No like, one. No like, can one. Can we talk about this guy? <laughs> like, I mean, Jesus, how many rushing yards did he have? Like 10? No, he had, well, because he probably had a, he, he had a, probably a couple decent ones, but he had like 20 carries for 62. That is past unacceptable yeah and his backup had four for other, 66 the, had the other 100 yeah he had four for 66 so it's funny i had the in guys i talked very highly on him um on derrick henry and probably even too good like where it doesn't match up with actually my beliefs the the problem is if you play the tennessee titans you are making Tannehill beat you because the thing that the Titans have done, I go, watch this, watch this, watch this. Uh, when you get hit and this is where like three runs, Henry had like, he didn't get touched till eight yards. So it's like three of those runs were half of his yards. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was on the same drive. And then Foreman, come, they're like, uh, he comes in uh, Foreman, I think Dante Foreman or Freeman. We'll just call him Dante. Yeah. Um, He took off a 45 yarder. Um, The thing is, they they just decide they're like, all right, we're not going to let Henry beat us. We're just going to we're going to make sure he doesn't. If you get someone even halfway in the backfield or just present, the guy has nice, great talent to run. If you have huge holes, which can I say this the past couple of years, the Titans have run blocking, have done a good job. He Mm -hmm. doesn't get hit. He can't, he has no agility. Like Mm -hmm. you're going to laugh. He's giant. He's fast and he's strong, but he's not fast until seven yards. So if you have a, if you have an O-line, everyone's like, this is amazing. It's like, yeah, if I was 250 pounds and had seven yards to no, it would actually be more than seven yards because you're also in the backfield. You get speed. You can't be tackled. You're saying he's fast. He's not quick. Yes, but it's also a buildup fast. Mm-hmm. It's not a, like, there's just a complete. Now, what would Christian McCaffrey do behind that line? That's my question. He, what, he, he would be in the training room. No, he would not. Because he, dude, this guy, bro, he sorry, gets hit. You sorry, get hit. We're getting off topic. You get, <laughs> no, but this is part of the game still. I you know. get seven Christian yards. Christian McCaffrey just pisses me off because it, how does he okay. get hurt? And then he gets hurt getting hurt. Well, Bro, the thing is, you get seven yards. He's not getting hit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's not getting yeah. hit. Yeah. Not getting hit. What about Aaron Jones from the Packers? What does he do behind that line? Oh, yeah. Not getting oh, hit. Yeah. Old buddy Saquon. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, that was the like, if I'm defensive corner, I'm just all right. Well, I'm just gonna put guys in an area and it's like, just don't let him get a get yeah. downhill at all. No, and, and, and we saw that Cincy's by the way. Defensive plan was awesome. It was awesome. They just we said we're not letting Derek Henry out. out. If they would have left in four, they would have left Foreman in. Yeah. And what did I say last week? I said people are making too big a damn deal over Derrick Henry coming because, back for play. Because Foreman was doing amazing. Yeah. He was a they really like, good running back. They had three, three, three different weeks. That they rush for over two two hundred yards well, without for- Derrick Henry. Well, in Foreman, the thing is with Foreman, he's a big back. But I'll tell you what, he uh, he he does have some agility. 
I'm not mm-hmm. saying he's better than Derrick Henry, but I'm just saying, like, yeah, I've always – like, what if you put him behind the Jets line? Henry, <laughs> what if you put – no, I'm. Th- this is just fair, yeah. super I'm, – I'm just – I'm trying to be really fair about things. What, what if you put well, him behind we the Carolina about, Panthers? We have talked – We've talked Ugh. about this, this do do, before, man. you know, when Ezekiel Elliott came out and was, all, Bro, I was, I hounded people about that. All everything. I said, look at the line he's playing behind. Yes. I could go over there and rush and be top three in the league rushing. Are you you Nah, me? I think you, I think you win the rushing title. Yeah, maybe. But that's just because you're good at running the football. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, you think, you think about that. Think, th- think about it. Oh. Well, and that's what they ran into is they had a defense that said, we will make Tannehill beat us. And that's it. Tannehill's going to beat us. And if he does, then he beats us. Then we lose. Now, and they, well, and, what was and they still almost beat me, him. What was disappointing to me about that is if you're truly the best, the best running O-line in the league, it doesn't matter what a defense says. If they're saying, oh, we're taking away, we're taking away your running game. But you're truly the best. I agree, but slot, if, you if, you, if you if you have someone, see, this is where our our views differ. But if you have someone like that, you're if, if you get someone kind of remotely in his face, he, he's he's not agile, so he's yeah. gonna yeah, I know he's gonna, he's. He, uh, I'm saying now, maybe if you have a different type of back back there, I mean, I think it changes things. Well, you have I to have say, someone that can make the first guy miss. Like, I mean, look at the difference between Emmett Smith and Barry Sanders. Mm-hmm. Emmett Smith walked through holes. Barry Sanders was dancing in the backfield because he had the trash bag line of the Detroit Lions, and he still ran for 2000 in a year. Like, I remember watching. It's like, I don't even know how this is happening. And then Emmett would be walking. He, it's like he was running out, you know, like when starting lineups happen. It's like you're running out of the tunnel and it's just lined and it's like high five, yeah, woo, let's go. That's that's been Derrick Henry okay. in some ways. Like, okay. oh so, yeah, starting at running back number twenty two, Emmett Smith or Derrick Henry. And so, oh yeah. So I'd say woo. it's an indictment then on all the other defensive coordinators in the league. That I I agree because there's a lot of bad coaches that say ah nah we're just gonna play our defense. It's like no. But in 2009 and 2010, when we're in New New York and we're the number one rushing team in the NFL both years, and we have Mark Sanchez as our quarterback, this is not a slight to Mark. Friend of the pot. We are the number one rushing team. Teams knew that that was all we were going to do is run the ball, and they still Mm -hmm. couldn't stop us. But the thing is, too, that year and those years – you guys also had, which helps. You guys could do that because you had a dominant defense. Yeah. That was, if somehow you ran, like, that you can keep doing that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If, like, you get stopped a couple drives, you can keep doing that. I just think, me personally, doing that is really hard to win a Super Bowl. I think you have to be able to, I mean, there's not a ton of teams that have done that because when they do stack the line, you have to just be like, all right, the best thing, as long as you have an actual arm in the backfield, you, well, the you, you have to are, are kind of doing it. Yeah. And they lost the super bowl. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying it's, it's hard. And, and let me say this. I think, I think it could happen, but you got to have a good defense. And D'Amico Ryan's is that's that's how you guys did it with the Jets. You guys could have, but I think you run it. You go yeah, up against we had the a time big power. To run it forty times a game. Yes. Whereas, not ever like even like. This is the thing that I learned in New England. You better be able to do both, and you better be able to do both really well. Because if not, like that's how you win Super Bowls. Like because mm-hmm. Bill is like like. Hey guys, we're there were games we threw it 50 times and there were games we ran it 50 times and people were like, I don't get I don't I'm a fantasy football player and I don't understand what they're doing. It's like, yeah, because we never knew what we were doing mm-hmm. until a game and and it's like if you if they are gonna stop the run, you better know how to pass. 
if they're doing everything in their like power to stop Tom and drop eight, you better be able to run the football. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's where, like, I didn't agree with, there were some coaches that we had that are, it's like, when it's fourth and two or fourth and one, and we got to get a yard, it doesn't matter what defense they play. I never disagreed more. I know you're an O-lineman, so you disagree. But, like, <laughs> I learned in New England, well, actually, that's not the best play call. If they're going to have no one covering a guy, it's actually an easy throw. So, like, we come from two different school of thoughts. But uh, what we're trying to say at the end of the day is Tennessee should have won, and they didn't take it. Really, I, in some way, like, the Bengals, like, Joe Burrow's a savage. I didn't really feel like the Bengals took it. I felt like their defense took it. No, their defense. But I'm saying their offense didn't really. No. You know what I'm saying? No, like, their because didn't, they're, didn't cause, I'll lot. tell you why. Because Joe Burrow had no time to throw the ball. Yeah. He was like, this is going to be, the, he, pass is called again. Oh, crap, Zach. Like, why are you calling pass? I don't want to get tackled again. But him and, him and Chase, when they had to have it there at the end, they had it. No, they I did. Mean, I mean, but, it was, it was pretty awesome to see the, since he's defense, you know, I tweeted about it in the game. Like they were, they were pretty special. No, no, okay. they were. And, and the thing is too. So it's just kind of like, but then it's like, you're also like, but the Titans played so bad. Like what mm -hmm. were they doing? Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of a, yeah. I don't know. It was. Yeah. Well, we got three more games. Yeah. And that was about. the, and that was probably the least interested I was out of the three or out yeah. of the four, but Derrick Henry, super great running back. I'm just saying, I didn't, I don't love it for certain situations. Super happy for the Bengals, though. My guy Zach Zach Taylor, super proud of him. What he's been able to do. Cincinnati fans, they have been starving for something like this. So, really, really proud of the team and really proud for the fans. So, yeah. Next game, 49ers and Packers. Never been more upset. Well, no, I definitely have been more upset, but I was just, I was just really, really disappointed with uh, the Packers here. The Packers play all around the 49ers, very disappointed with their play <laughs> all around. Didn't matter. I, I would, I would almost say I was more disappointed with the 49ers play more than the Packers. It's just, I feel like the Packers special teams wanted the Niners to win so bad mm -hmm. like they were like let's find a way to let them win because we are friends with some people on the other team well what I was disappointed about is you know the 49ers uh style travels very well like we alluded to back yes in, back with the Jets Great that was a dome defense, hey hey if that was a warm run. weather dome game Packers win that easy um it it was a uh it, their their style it travels to the frozen tundra of green bay awesome but that's green bay's home field aaron plays cold <clears throat> all the time those receivers run cold all the time they were tiptoeing through the damn tulips out there nobody was running a clean clean route Aaron had no idea how to throw the ball there because his receivers were tiptoeing around. He had no idea the timing of the throws. Oh, it was just garbage nation. It's so hard to run routes in that. And the, it's like, and, and I get it's, it. It's but the so Packers like, have been doing it. Yes. But like, not all, I mean, Devonte Adams. Sure. Right. But like they're tight ends. Some of Devonte's routes I saw, he was running it <clears throat> fast and crisp. But, but it's, other it's, guys are running around but it's like, hard. like they're on fucking ice skates. Bro, it's so hard to, like, and I've always said this, if you have really good skill players, like really good skill players, the ultimate, like, leveling the playing field is bad weather like that. Yeah. It's just, uh, even even if you've been there, because the thing is, you know how it is. Yeah, you they're from San Francisco. Your footing. Yeah, you can't. And if it happens once, 
it you're like crap yeah. now i have to stay on my feet yeah it's, it's the just same a thing when i would go and play in oakland when they had the 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 baseball field still still set set up the first quarter that that game i would have zero confidence in like bracing on a see on a bull rush right see something like that's okay though for like skill players because it's like yeah. i can still get open it's traction for an o-lineman i would love that weather for a skill player there is nothing worse and it feels like your athletic ability is like cut in half and it sucks right but what I'm saying is I would understand the 49ers skill skill players having issues make making the cuts coming out of their breaks because they don't play in that. But think about this. The Packers I play, play I, in that. I played for the Chargers, but I grew up in that. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to play in it. You know what I'm yep. saying? Whereas in the NFL, there's so much movement. There's a lot of guys in San Fran that have, have played in that weather. I just think it's I think it's an overrated deal. Like when people say like green because there's a lot of people in green bay that are from california you know what i'm saying oh yeah yeah but i'm but i'm saying they play in that enough because they play in those games every year up there uh the 49ers don't play in those types of games every year uh so so i guess what it is is as I'm saying, I'm more disappointed in the Packers that they let the weather affect yeah. them like that. Well, I, will... I could have seen the weather affecting the 49ers like that. But second half, I think it played so much into the 49ers hands because when the snow started coming first half, I agree with you a little bit more, but second half Packers are a throwing team. They don't run the ball mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I think it just, it made it hard either way. They were going to win. If, but, if it weren't for but the Packers teams. can can run the ball there they can't they can but I'm saying like their, their strength sub, is throwing their sub run running game is pretty legit and and they did try it but again O-line trash bag nation it it's the level of offensive line play in the NFL right now is the don't absolute worst that. it has ever been in the history of football and I and I will say this there were plenty of times you just get someone pushed back uh, in the middle, in the pocket, and you have your DNs doing their job on the outside. Like, there are a couple times, like, Aaron couldn't even look downfield. Yeah. Like, it was but like... even the 49ers, too. I mean... Yeah, but that, they, they, they don't have, have a passing attack anyways. No, but... but well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they, don't, they don't have a ton of receive... Like, they have Kittle. And I'll yeah. tell you what, there were some good throws by Garoppolo that actually got dropped and you're like, oh, well, yeah, yeah. A couple drops. Um, I mean, it took him like what? Eight, eight passes to complete a fucking ball. Yeah. It was gross. Uh, but the thing is that that's, he's, he played in new England. He knows what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, that's putting, not an excuse not for him putting it on him, but you know, deep Debo Samuel, they can put him anywhere on the field to play. Um, Kit, Kittle obviously a stud um but the 49ers offensive line is is supposed to be really really good and even they were just getting just tossed around out there no it was it was not good football I think the biggest thing was block field goal block punt so at the end of the day even though their offense didn't play great their def Joe Barry did a heck of a job as a D coordinator, by the way, against San Francisco. Holy moly. Mm -hmm. Did amazing. They gave up three or six points. I don't know how the first three happened, but like six points. If you give up six points in a football game with the Aaron Rodgers and crew, you're winning 99.9999% 99 of the time. Mm-hmm. But the special teams, I f you don't, I don't to a sense, in a sense, but like, I really do kind of feel bad for the special teams. Like, All right, explain that to me. Coordinator. The only I reason I say bad for them. the special teams coordinator, because the coordinator can't go out there and just miss blocks. Like, it wasn't all on him. You know what I'm saying? Or like, hey, like. Oh, 
yeah. you know what I'm saying? And he's going to get pegged with all of this. And it's like, just, just block your guy. Like there was, it was an easy pickup on the punt block. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly. Well, it was that giant, giant ass white, white dude came straight up the middle, buried through the snapper's face. It shouldn't and, be the snapper's uh, job, though. No, it shouldn't. It, because and, it's a six-man protection. There should be help on the interior. Right. But also, isn't there a rule? Like, you aren't allowed to just go straight down the snapper's face. You can't, but if you start from the side, you can. But then how did it get there that fast? I have no idea, Because man. if you start lined up over the guard, and then you stunt down over the snapper and, and bull rush through him, you should never have time to get there ever as i'm watching i'm going i don't understand how this even happened so either he lined up directly over the snapper's face and the officials missed it or that snapper is built like a wet piece of paper i mean it was gross i don't know man it's just it's one of those things where you're just like i mean he is on the side he's not at all on the i mean it was a quick step yeah, but like, so, so either the operation took way too long to get the punt off, or that snapper is a piece of paper. Well, it doesn't ma- it doesn't matter if it's a six man box. There should be two guys on him. You know, when you're in high school, and you the only reason I know this is because of personal protector. That should never happen. Yeah, because there should be someone at least getting in the way. But you like, know, when you're in high school and 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 you you run out before the game and they have the big piece of paper up that the cheerleaders are holding that they wrote like go wildcats or whatever and you the team busts through the paper and runs on the field yeah that's essentially how the the long snapper was blocking but but the thing but the thing is like he doesn't have like the guy had a little momentum and, and the guy's big yes he's, and the and long snappers he's a aren't defensive big. tackle he's a and defensive long snappers tackle. aren't big but the personal protector should be helping. That's mm-hmm. that's the whole thing is the personal protector went to the other side. Like if the personal protector would have been helping, it would have been off. Because it was essentially, it was like five or six guys and that should be the easy, you should never, ever get a pump blocked on that, ever. But, but it happened. It happened. I don't I have no freaking idea, but it happened. Tampa Bay, Los Angeles Rams. Well, oh, hold on, hold on. You, Before we get onto that, okay. Uh, do you want to uh, just? Oh, wait. Let's let's just talk about a the Rod. Post, the post game press conference. Yeah. Let Let me say this. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot that. A Rod, I personally love it for him. Everyone's like, ah, I love it. He's he's piecing out of there. There's no chance he's coming back. You think? They they're forty some million over the cap right now. They're not going to be able to pay him and Devontae Adams. If if A-Rod's there with no Devontae Adams, I mean, it's like, deuce, I'm out. I'm, I'm, that would be like a running back saying like, yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stay. Oh, oh, we don't have any offensive linemen? Yeah, I'm going to stay. That's what, off, that, that's what like, it would be like Le'Veon Bell when he signed with the New York Jets. Like, it's just not a good situation. Like, if I'm an A-Rod can go, there's plenty of places. Like, Pittsburgh will do anything to get him. Mm-hmm. Anything. Pittsburgh yeah. says, hey, we need you. We're going to figure it out. We'll trade at 74 first round, the next 74 years of our first round picks. Uh... Like, Bro, like it's it's a no brainer. Even not Pittsburgh. There's if you're a football team outside of Tampa Bay, Kansas City, or like a three others, you're like, yeah, I'll I'll look into trading hmm. for the best quarterback in the league right now. Yep. I mean, I don't know. I just I would. Uh, well, so that wasn't me taking the other position and saying I hope he stays. But if I'm Green Bay, I'm doing everything I can to make sure he stays. Their so cap much thing's so, going to make it hard, though. So much so that I am eliminating the cap issues on the defensive side. 
because the Packers have done it before where they have had zero defense and they just say, Aaron, do your thing on offense. But the thing is, the Patriots if they don't get Devontae it. back, that's the, the problem. The Patriots have done it with Tom where they said, you know what? We're going to have the worst defense in the league. I don't care. Yeah, when I was there. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care. We're, we're just going to go. Offense, go. Tom, go. Go do your thing. They aren't going to be able to keep up with as many points as we are, we are, we're going to yeah. score. So you pretty much eliminate all your cap issues on the defensive side. Perfect. Done. On the offensive side, you don't need to go and get more, more weapons. You got Devontae, who's the best, the best well, receiver in the league. Well, they don't have Devontae. He's a free agent. Sorry. You do what you got to do to sign him. I don't know how you do that. You got to Because he's going to, bro, he's going to make him the highest close to paid. 20. You he's got to make him the highest paid receiver in the league because he deserves that. But then you also have to, the thing that people don't know is it's A-Rod's last year. His cap hits 45 million. Mm-hmm. They don't want to pay him. They don't want to, they want to keep him like a year at a time because that's what their general managers or their mm-hmm. front office is doing. Well, they you need have to fire give him. him. A, they need to fire him. But, but they're not going to. They're owned, they're owned by you and me, by a bunch of people. Like, it's not even real. That's the problem with Green Bay. I, I, yeah. In well, some ways, that's well, a listen, problem. Listen. Uh, they have great the facilities, but side, other than that. You find a way to, to make Devontae the highest paid. Okay, and then you got uh, you got the Tun Tunyon guy who's a pretty freaking good receiver or pretty good tight end. Tight tight end, but he was hurt, so that. Uh, yeah. And and, who's, and who else? Who's their number two re- re- receiver? Uh, what what's his name? Uh, gosh, Lazard. You're yeah, saying? Lazard. Lazard's I, good enough. L- Lazard's good enough. He's like a middle of the road receiver, but between uh, between Devontae. Tunyon, Lazard, Jones, you got enough weapons for Aaron to be happy. What you got to do is fix the freaking old line. I don't, fix I don't that. think that is enough. I don't think, I don't think that would keep him happy. And, and, and let me say this. I don't know where he's at, what year it is. I, I really don't. I, but he was, he, he was playing on the last year of his deal. Lazard. He's commanding five, six million. I don't know if they have that. Well, you know the salary cap is going to go up again to two hundred ninety sixty four. I don't think it's going to go up that crazy amount, bro. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying I'm worried. I, I don't yeah, know they how say they keep that him. every year, and then guess what? Right after free agency, oh, well, we found some more money. It's going up another fifty. They're going to have to fire everyone in the building in order to keep Aaron. They might fire us. Yeah. Well, which the, pa- the Packers can fire me. But all I'm saying is if, is if you find a way to keep the offensive players you got and you fix the offensive line, you, you sign but that, Bakhtiari. that includes money. You sign Bakhtiari to a deal that says, if you get hurt again, we're cutting your deal in half so we can go get a, get a tackle that, that can fucking play, all right? Because you can't play in like three games all year. Be, but be next thing you know, he best. signs somewhere else for a big deal. You're then you're you're playing with wet paper okay. bags. Okay, Bakhtiari, then get the hell out of the. But build, you're playing build, with wet building. paper bags, like yeah. actual paper bags, drenched from a a, th- a Nebraska summer thunderstorm. Yeah. So so go and go and get an offensive line you can depend on, because let's 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 be honest here, guys. Let me give you a little insight into playing O-line for the Green Bay Packers. I've never played O-line for the Green Bay Packers, but I played O-line for a lot of years, and I played against the Packers a lot. Playing tackle for Green Bay is the easiest place to play tackle because what their system is, is tackles get beat however you want because Aaron Aaron can duck under and get out or we're going to give you 13 million a year to get beat. However you want to actually, get beat however you want, you know, who's in charge of setting the protection, the guards in the center, they got to have the most badass interior three to set to, to, to draw a line in the sand and say, nobody's coming past right here. Tackles get beat. However the hell you want. I'll tell you what the line in the sand was destroyed in the yes, last Yes, it game. was. 
And that, that is what I'm saying. You, you couldn't fix, even see the line. You fix the inside three, which is going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than fixing tackles. You fix the inside three, give Aaron all that space in the middle to move around and duck around and, and do whatever he's got to do. It's, it's going to cost less to find three badass inside guys than it will be to find two tackles. I can't wait to see him in another Jersey. It will be an awesome story. It'll be, it'll be amazing. And he'll go to a place and it's like, Oh, you support me and you want me here. Oh, you're not going to get a first rounder and trade all our picks to trade or to, or to get a, you're, you're not going to use our first rounder that we needed that could have helped us get over the hump. Oh, that's amazing. That's neat. I never yeah. knew that we, I didn't never knew that organizations worked like this. Well, and you actually bring in veteran free agents that are proven oh. and can help. Weird. Weird how that works. Oh, this is amazing. What if he went to San Francisco? Yeah, that'd be gross. That'd be unfair is what it would be. Go, going on to the next game, we, we got to move on. Tampa Rams. Super trash bag of a game to start. It really was. Like, it, it just wasn't real. Until yeah. the Rams said, this is boring. Roger called up Sean McVay, Roger Goodell, and said, start doing some really bad stuff. We, uh, th- we're losing ratings. Do some bad stuff. Tell some guys to fumble. Hey, maybe even when you're up seven, have your running back fumble, even though the game's over. Which I respect that Sean McVay was like, yeah, sounds good. I'll, I'll get it done. This, this Rams running back, who, by the way, I'm a huge fan of. This guy is What, what was he doing, though? He's like, savage, but what geez. was he doing? Hold on to the dang ball. As Bill Belichick would say, what are you doing? Ugh. What are you? What's his Cam. name? Cam. Cam. Michelle. Cam Michelle. Or no, it's Cam Akers. Cam. Oh. Who's the Michelle you guy? Who am I doing? Thinking? It's like Bill. Yeah, I'll tell you what he was doing. He was he was trying to break a sixty yarder when we didn't need one. That's what he was trying to do. Unbelievable player, by the way. That dude is fast and he but, runs hard. He runs but, angry. <laughs> but hold on to the ball. Hold on to the ball. We don't even need a first down. Yeah. Like let's. It was second down. It was going to be third and one. And then they were going to have another crack at it. You didn't need to get it all done then. Um, can, can we talk about the offensive linemen for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers go? Uh, well, I think... Or, or the, tack- the left tackle and right tackle mainly. Yeah, well, they, don't, they were playing without them. So what would you do... If I'm an offensive coordinator and we had a gar- two guards and a center... I don't know what protection I'd run. Well, it, it has become arena football. And, and Tom's not a runner. Maybe yeah. you could do that with Lamar Jackson, but with Tom Brady, not working. Mm-mm. Yeah. When you're trying to protect with, without two tackles, you're obviously not going to be able to run the ball either without two no, tackles. You, no. So, I actually felt bad for, like, Anyone in the world that's seen Tom, and and by the way, he had two guys that were two of the better receivers in the league not playing too. One because of had a cool little incident in New York, and then the other got hurt. So like he's playing with he's like playing with a bunch of misfit toys, right? Mm -hmm. Which he's done a lot of before in the past. He has, but been successful still. He had misfit toys at skill position. And then he had no toys on the offensive line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And really the inside three, uh, not really impressed with that inside three. Anyway, um, Ryan Jensen credit to him for, for coming in and fighting, fighting while, yeah. while being, being hurt. I think while being hurt, considering the group that he was blocking performed pretty well. Yeah. Well, I mean, the guys he was blocked. Yeah, Aaron Donald was. <laughs> but I think Tampa Bay's guards are trash. Yeah. Um, so it was actually Ryan Jensen in the running back having to take care of five guys, mm-hmm. four or five guys. And at times that's how it looked. 
because Von Miller was just running scot free all over the place. And that got in Tom's head so fast as soon as Vaughn gave him the little chin chin music there at the beginning of the game. Speaking of speaking of uh, the ref, like, first of all, was it a penalty on Vaughn? It probably was. But because you can't go up and launch up you, like that's that's been illegal even seven years ago. Yeah. Now, but I, I didn't see him hit hit him. In, bro, in it was the, it was right up under the chin. But, but I did that, see the launch. I'm fine. I saw if, the launch. Yes. Whatever. And if you don't call it whatever, but you can't call that on Tom. Like yeah. that was clown stuff. Like that's the ref trying to make a statement and you don't want, you don't want any statements in playoff games. If you're a ref, what you want is to try to get to the next game. You're not getting to the next game by doing that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that crew isn't going to ref, ref the Super Bowl. I tell you that. No, uh, but no, uh, they, yeah, the, it appeared as though, you know, all the, all the flack the officials have taken over the years about protecting Tom and, and, and they there don't was give no protecting. They, they don't give the same protection to anybody else in the league that they give, give to Tom so much so that they start creating rules middle of the game. Hence, hence the tuck rule. Uh, yeah. The, the Tom Brady tuck rule, but Tom just, Brady wasn't really Tom Brady then. No, but because he was Tom, they, they created a rule in the middle of a game to say like, Oh yeah, he was tucking it. But, uh, but then it carries over to any of the others. Yeah. But, but that, that, that's always like a running joke. Like if, yeah, if it can work out for Tom, the officials will make sure it works out for Tom in this game. It appeared to be that the officials are like, all right, enough of that. No, it appeared that they're like, Hey, let's make sure let's, let's not, let's not have a good story for him. I don't know. It was but even still, e he didn't have a shot because of the defensive line he's playing against. Even if he had his whole starting crew of offense with, with, with that offensive line, I don't think there's a chance, right? No, no. I just don't. I, I, I don't think there's a chance. Like it was, it was unfair, not for him, but for the rest of the bucks, they like skill position. They couldn't even run routes. It's like, in, what are we going to do? Bubble screen them to death. Let's say everybody on Tampa was 100% healthy. Still Besides the line or whatever. Still doesn't matter. If you have all of Tampa's offensive linemen playing, it doesn't matter. It was, it was a tragedy. But somehow, like we said, I, I, I want to get to the, the last play of the game because this is a little disturbing to me. <sighs> they somehow tied it. They're at midfield. And they, they blitz the slot corner off of Cooper Cup and say, hey, safety, you have to cover Cooper Cup, who is the best receiver in the NFL. I don't care what anyone says. What he has done this year, and after watching him more and more, I'm like, I don't, I don't know who's better than him. I, I have no idea. He might may not do like these flashy catches. The guy is always always open like yeah. always and you you're gonna supposedly bruce arian said another guy that was supposed to blitz didn't blitz well that's not not my, not my problem don't put a safety on cooper cup mm -hmm. that's a runoff and and matt stafford even said it it's like a runoff that he should never get the ball on that play he's like a runoff guy it's a love of the game route is what it is what matt stafford call it and that's what we'd always call it like you're it's running off well, he ran off pretty good yeah. because for you listeners, a Matt, runoff, a runoff deal is your job is to run a route to take clear somebody people out. Out, out of the area because so you have an in cut coming in. Probably you are a decoy. That's why and they, they call well, it love of the game, uh, because you aren't going to get glory on that play. And Matt Stafford said, oh, my gosh, not did he say this? I don't know. My guess is that's what he said as I was watching him. Oh. These guys are idiots. They put a safety on Cooper Cup. Might as well throw it to him because he's wide open. Mm -hmm. It's just like situational football, and we'll get to that in the next next game too. But it's like there's certain things that win and lose games. They lost it. They lost it. I'd love, by the way, I, I hate Todd Bowles as a coordinator because he made it miserable for the offense. But like, 
I also love him. But that I didn't love that call. I don't want Cooper Cup on a safety ever. I don't even want a corner on him. If anything, I'm actually putting a corner and a safety on him. There you go. That makes sense. But that's also just science. Yep. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, my perspective is, is football is getting think... worse. The, the exactness, the professionalism, it's getting worse. And when, when things are getting worse and coaches are making things more complicated, you're going to be putting some bad football out there on the field. Uh, I mean, I, I still watch, watch film from, from back in the day, you know, the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, the late 2000s, even the, the early 2010s. Now I'm speaking more so from offensive line play, right? But just my, my, my perspective on this is when I came in into the league in 2009, the, the difference between great O lines and bad O lines, that separation was like this so small. Yeah. Now there's now, a huge gap. Now the difference between great O lines and battle lines, I mean, you, you can't even fit it on the screen how big it is, but also great O lines aren't even as good as battle lines back then. Like that is what's crazy to me about this. And, and the thing that's nuts is they can cover it up a little and we'll talk about it in like the Kansas city game, but like, because now this is from 2008 to 2000, like 17 when I was done. Right. Mm -hmm. The, the concepts are so much better now for like receiving, like the plays are so much better because there's more, they've, they've figured out ways to receivers can, break off routes in certain coverages or do different things. But there's also, a, there's also some people that are stuck in the two thousands and that's why they can't get it figured out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then the Kansas cities of the world just got so their ceiling is so much higher than say, uh, I'm not going to say any teams, but say another team mm -hmm. that can't get over the hump. Like they're, they're in the old school west coast where there's no convert you don't convert routes you don't do different things whereas like maybe you should do what andy reed does and just like keep getting better and pushing it up pushing the ceiling pushing the ceiling and the thing that's tough though is with when you have bad o lines you can't even do those mm -hmm. and it's just trash that's why you need something that's at least halfway serviceable yeah um yeah, they it's it's the pros are getting closer and closer to college, college type of play, where you just got these mastermind offensive coordinators that are just coming up with ridiculousness to cover up for bad O line play. They say, okay, if we're gonna have a horseshit offensive line, then we'll just get this ball out super fast in the most creative ways possible. Yeah. Uh and and we'll just recruit the best playmakers most athletic biggest fastest strongest play playmakers that you get the ball out in two seconds even if you're throwing them a jump 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 ball they're just so much better that they're just going to go and go and get it and i gotta tell you i have no respect for that i hate it right i agree i do agree fully like if you want to be great you got to do everything great yeah you don't settle moving on don't care anymore about that game um the chiefs bills i mean there's a decent amount. you can talk about o-line if you want i i really want to just get to the end of the game yeah, my personal there, there wasn't a whole lot there wasn't of of horseshit o-line play it yeah was, there really wasn't was there? it was just sort of average i think yeah. the chiefs o -line but average looked, right now is unbelievable right uh i think the chiefs o-line looked worse than the bills o-line for sure. Um, uh, but there was still some bad, bad stuff out of the bills. Christian Jones for the chiefs. That is a real man's man right there. That is a big, strong, scary, athletic dude. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, I played against them a lot. I understand what that task is like. Um, It's probably Aaron Donald stuff, right? But in a different way. uh, Yeah, just uh, not not quite as freakish as Aaron is, but he's a hell of a lot bigger than Aaron is. So so he's freakish in a different way. Uh, He's also angry. Chris Jones is a very angry, angry player. Um, I think Chris Jones sucks when he plays over the right guard and he's all pro when he plays over the left, left guard. Uh, so I think old, old spags would be better served to Just keeping him, him over there to keep him over the left side, um, as opposed to making him the three technique and playing to the strength. Cause as we know, in the league, most formations are set to the right most of them um which means the majority of the time chris jones is going to be playing over the right and he's not as good over there but when you put him on the left he goes Night- crazy. nightmare and luckily josh allen's a freak so he's Gosh, gonna, not even a real person huh i mean the amount of sacks he got out of over, over there was stupid L- let me say this because i think pat like you know my feelings on pat mahomes savage right josh allen what he did was absolutely crazy like he has some good players on his receivers but nothing no tyree kill or no travis kelsey right like yeah, old pat mahomes cole, cole could beasley throw it decided he didn't want to play no cole beasley had a pretty good game oh he yeah some, i think so I mean, he had like seven for 70 almost. Uh, how about that 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 other dude? What's the name? Greg uh, something Davis, other? Jeremy Davis or something. Eight receptions for 201. Yeah. No, it was. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, like. Josh Allen, though. He is a freak show. The in throws abs- he makes. It's ridiculous. In, in, in the thing is what he did personally now he only beasley only had six for 60 but still like that's a that's a good game for a yeah, slot receiver yeah, that is good but like the thing is josh allen won that game josh allen won the game did pat mahomes play good yeah i mean sure without a doubt but like let's just think of it like tyree kills a different human being travis kelsey different human being like those guys are fake like mm-hmm. they should be illegal because of how good they are at, in the past game josh allen willed them to that game and this is where i want to get to it's 13 seconds in the game this is this is something that i have a lot of frustration on you win and lose playoff games or n- any game with situ- situational football mm-hmm. they were up 36 to 33 right they went 13 60, seconds. 60 yards in five seconds. And, and this is this is the thing. Is or not five. Eight, yes. Eight the, seconds. The number one thing they did wrong is they didn't squib it. 13 mm-hmm. seconds gives you three plays, and that has to be included with the field goal. So really you have two plays if you have 13 seconds. So you kick it through. If you squib the ball, it's going to at least be like three, four seconds. Mm-hmm. Pro- You know what I'm saying? So take it down to nine seconds. You have two plays Mm -hmm. from the, we'll say 30 yard line. Say they had a great return. You have two plays. It's not enough. It's not enough to get into field goal. Yes, they could get a Hail Mary situation. No doubt. But with 13 seconds, you have two offensive plays, especially with those timeouts. You have two offensive plays. And that's what they did on first down on both of them. Actually on the first initial play from the 25 yard line, the bills had timeouts too. So they took what we would call a Kodiak timeout. It's taking a picture of the formation they're in. So then, you know, okay, we can play defense against this. What ends up happening is the bills move back like their prevent defense, which makes no sense. So they throw it in the bunch to Tyreek Hill. They have two blockers. Essentially, they're running a screen. Yes. And it was the easiest 19 yards I have ever seen in my life. Ever. Then it comes to the next first down. I can't remember what yard line they were on. It would have been the 
44. 44. And they had eight seconds. And they had eight seconds. So it's like you don't have a ton of time. You gotta you gotta get going, especially to get whatever you need to do. So they go in a three by O formation where Travis Kelsey's alone on the left side. They're playing a weak prevent zone, a huge gap for Travis Kelsey, where he runs a skinny post ish. He just, he runs with a little outside release to widen the gap between the corner and the linebacker. And the gap was 15 yards. Mm -hmm. And by the way, people, they took a Kodiak timeout before that too. So they, they had an idea what's going on. Play defense, just play defense. And it's not even happening, but yet they get in to where it's a 47, 48 yarder for one of the best kickers in the NFL. And it's like, we just gave you the game. You mm -hmm. squib kick it. You're, you're, you're losing unless you went on a hail Mary. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. We, you're saying, hey, you know what? We're ahead by three. Let's give you a chance. Let's get the ratings even higher because we'll go to OT. It'll be fun. Maybe we'll win the coin toss or maybe we'll lose it and lose. I have no problems with the overtime. I have no problems with the overtime. You should have won with 13 seconds left. Yeah. It's yeah. been the overtime rules since the beginning of time. Maybe decide to halfway play defense, even in overtime. You have a chance. People that say, well, they never had a chance. No, you did have a chance. Don't let them score a touchdown. Don't let them score a touchdown. 13 seconds to go 60 Bro, yards. 13 stop seconds. Them. Yes, stop them even there. But, like, kick, squib kick it or kick a high one to the five-yard line. It's going to waste time. Mm -hmm. It's going to waste. Even, it's even if these players have the wherewithal to go to the official – and say, hey, on this return, I'm giving myself up to save time. But think about it. They'd have to give up, give themselves up at the 15-yard line. Right. But even if they squib it and they say, whoever's getting the ball is giving themselves up, it's still running two seconds off. At least. Yeah. And it, but, but the thing is, if they give themselves up even on a squib, they're not even getting to the 20 maybe. Mm -hmm. They're getting to, I don't know, the 17. That 10 yards is huge. And the two seconds or three seconds is two, huge. three seconds is huge. Yeah. Like that's, what's disappointing is I felt like it robbed jo like what they have to do. Like, yeah. Hey, I never thought, man, they scored too early. They left 13 seconds on the clock. All right. No, never. Anyone in their right mind cannot let an offense get in field goal range with if you have to go the length of the 13 field, sure but like 10 let's say it's an aaron rod rogers well even a patrick mahomes on the other side and you left 40 seconds then i'd say too much time and if yeah, that's that's too, different too much time 13 seconds game's over yeah game's over. And, and just screw yeah. it get it to not to nine or ten seconds <laughs> and they have to go that they still have to go that same amount of yards in nine or ten seconds so say it's 10 seconds. Oh, they throw the Tyree kill to the 44. Oh, five seconds. Crap. We have nothing else we can do. We have to Hail Mary it. Mm -hmm. We can't get this in four seconds. Not to where Travis Kelsey went to. Yeah. Or unless you're going to throw like a, like a 10 yard. Out Clowny to, world. 15 yard out to get a little closer to make it a 60 yard field goal in January in Kansas city. Unrealistic. Sure. Sure. Kansas city went out and did it, but like, I, I Kansas City didn't win that game. Buffalo lost it. Yeah. They Buffalo's won the game coaching. in overtime. Buffalo's coaching lost. Yes, it. they lost it. It wasn't the players. D did they win overtime? Yeah, sure. Whatever. Kansas City didn't win the regulation. They didn't even get into overtime. It was it was a Christmas gift from the Buffalo Bills staff. It really mm -hmm. was. And it sucks too from like even like the offensive staff. They did everything. Yeah. Like, what are we doing? It's a real shame that Josh Allen played that, that miraculous. <clears throat> I mean, sure, doesn't, sure, doesn't Pat Mahomes it. deserves it too. Like, he played so good. But, like, Josh Allen, that was one of the craziest performances I've ever seen in a fourth quarter, ever. Yeah. I, I believed whoever won that game was winning the AFC Championship and going to the Super Bowl. And um, I, I just don't... 
don't see a way after how since he's played the last two two games that they would have any shot against the Chiefs. Who knows though? Who knows? But they did beat him in they did beat him in the end of regular or into the regular season. Yeah, but, but that was also when when uh the Chiefs they weren't even playing foot, football. Well, they were point. still playing for the number one seed though at that time. Because they would have been the number one seed, I think, unless Tennessee came back. Either way, yeah. I'm saying they had something to play for, but it wasn't like this. We'll see what happens, man. We'll see what happens. I think it's going to be interesting having the Bengals go to Kansas City. Yes, Kansas City's favored. L.A., San Francisco is going to be great because Sam Fran has beat them twice this year, but I just. Yeah, beating a team three times in a year. Not so bueno. It's, it's, it's a tall, tall task, especially because the Rams are. I, I mean, yeah, I know they, they had some craziness happen yes, yes, yesterday with all the fumbles, but as good as their defense is playing and the fact that Stafford is reining it in a little bit on, uh, on, you know, the, the risky, risky plays. Um, now, I still love him for it, uh, the gunslinger mentality, but he's not being as reckless anymore. Uh, and you know, this coaching staff is going to be coaching the hell out of ball security. Um, I mean, I said this at the beginning of the year, I think the, the Rams are just too stacked. They have too many playmakers all over the field. And, uh, I just, I just don't see a way the 49ers can uh, do it. Um, you know, unless they just run run the hell out of the ball and and just keep keep the ball out of out of Stafford's hands, uh, but I think the Rams' defense is too good for that too. Uh, yeah, so I don't I don't know. I'm I, excited, but it's it's also gonna, I feel like anything's going to be a letdown. Yeah, I see next week's games as as being very one one-sided games and that's going to be disappointing for conference championships to me but right who knows who knows we'll see um yeah again i feel bad I feel bad for josh josh allen he he did everything humanly possible and it was an incredible game to watch the ridiculousness, the super unprofessionalism on the defensive side of the ball, the lack of coaching made it one of the greatest games in recent memory. Yeah, it was, this was a great weekend. Scotty, take it from here. With Joe's wisdom. <clears throat> and and uh, after just going through the breakdown of uh, – of football and bad coaching. Um, I know Danny, if you'd ever made it to in football, even though that was never even in your mindset that you weren't going to make it, but uh, I think you're, but if, but if for some reason, you know, things just didn't work out, I know you've mentioned um, you would have been a teacher. Is that correct? Yeah. Is is that what you want to do? I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. A teacher and a coach. Okay. (laughs) Which I mean, a coach is a teacher. Right. Let's be clear about this. Great football coaches are teachers. Are teachers. They teach you things about history, history of football. Yes. Um, Bill Belichick, honestly, one of the greatest teachers of of football, like the history of uh, not one of he was. Yeah, I, I, I had that, uh, you know, when I came in, when I came into college with Bill bill callahan you know one of the greatest greatest coaches i've been around um the the greatest coach that i've been around but when i came into college he would quiz me on football history and i I had no idea no freaking idea right but he would quiz everybody on the team uh the breakdown at the end of practice he would do the belichick thing where he'd call on players and ask them questions about the history of the game and if you didn't know, guess what? You just had a homework assignment. Right. Where you had to go find out and report back to it. Go ahead, uh, Scotty. What was the question? Yeah, oh, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, I was just I was just saying 
Scott, the transition from what just happened in the games to, to now talking about teaching. There's obviously not a lot of teaching going on in the NFL at the moment. Mm-hmm. I don't see a lot of teaching going on in college football. Well, it's because you can't hurt people's feelings anymore. That's right. the, and sometimes that happens. Right. But Danny teaching football teaching, yeah. you want to be a teacher and a coach. Those are one and the same. Yep. So, so let's well, talk about it. Yeah. What was the question that you had for it? So I, I'm, I'm going to say this would be twofold or maybe even threefold. Number one, I would love to know what, like, where was your vision for that to happen? Like, where did you pick that up or what inspired you to go, you know what? I want to teach a coach. Mm-hmm. And then number two, I mean, you've been around supposedly the best coaches slash teachers there are in the national football league. I would like you to tell me, I mean, we kind of mentioned it there. What's a really good teacher and a bad teacher. Um, And if you could kind of maybe go into that and you don't need to say names of coaching. I don't, I don't care whether you do or not, but like, who would you, how would you roll? Like, how would you teach today from everything you've learned? Like, how would you then take the good and the bad? And then what would, what would a class look like for, for Danny? Yeah. So Gosh, that is a lot, but that's okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. Um, what was the vision or why, why did I want to teach? I wanted to teach because I've always loved, um, I've loved kids. I mean, I have four kids myself. I love my nephews. I love my nieces. I've, I've just, there's something about, um, they're, they're so, uh, they haven't learned anything yet. You want to help guide them, help. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I just, I, I wanted to, I, I loved, maybe I even enjoyed being a leader and I didn't, I guess I didn't know that until now, maybe like, but my dad was a P elementary P teacher and he was all I ever heard. Some of it was, I wanted to be like my dad. Um, All I had ever heard in my life in North Platte, Nebraska, everyone would come up and be like, oh, your dad taught me. Oh, your dad taught me. And then even adults. And I was like, the impact that he had on so many human beings was like, whoa, like absolutely incredible. But it was always for a positive, right? It was never like, man, that guy sucked. I mean, some people are like, yeah, he was kind of strict, but like, I loved him. He was an amazing person. Anyone that he coached, this was the other thing I was going to do. I was going to teach and coach. Every player that played under him loved him. He had rules, but they loved him. And he impacted so many, so many people. And I remember people would come back and be like, my dad, your dad was the greatest coach I'd ever had. There'd be... I mean, my, my wife was in his PE class and he did something. He always, cause I ended up shadowing him for like a class. Like I can't remember what they called it, but whatever. I kind of just shadowed and the kids loved him so much because he, the thing that he always did. And I think, I think nowadays we're getting away from this. And this is what's scary about the human beings that are being raised, but he saw every kid. And what I'm saying he saw every kid is there's a lot of kids that maybe at home, it's like they don't, their parents don't see them, whatever. They just need to be seen. They need to be known that they're cared about. And my dad every single kid that walked through that door, they were seen. And, and he showed them, or at least they felt loved because he would have, he would have rules. By the way, everyone, kids want rules. They don't want to get away with everything. They don't want to get away with everything because when you do, it's like, that's when kids, everyone's like, Oh, my kids don't listen. Yeah, they don't, they're not listening because they want some sort of structure. Not like that you need to discipline them like crazy, but there just needs to be rules. 
and regulations, right? Accountability. And when that happens, kids crave that because when there's accountability, they're like, oh, this person cares about me. They, they, they actually freaking care about me. So I think when, when I look back, and I, it's funny, I'm talking this out right now. I think that's why I wanted, I wanted kids to be seen. Because there's a lot of kids, a lot of parents that don't see their kids. And their kids don't feel like they're seen by their parents. It's just like, okay, here's food. Here's this. Here's this. Go play. Go play this. Go play this. Get out of my face. And it's like, I, want, I wanted kids to be seen. I wanted them to feel significance. And, I mean, you want to see kids grow. I don't know how many kids. I even think back to the time I shadowed. And there were kids in the class that I shadowed that I saw in high school. And they grew up to be. And they remembered me when I was shadowing them and like to me that was really cool because it's how you treat people i mean it's more than just teaching it's how you how you treat people is how you're going to be remembered not what you do not like how much money you made how much um success you had at your job it's how you treat other human beings and i i wanted to be a part of that i wanted to to be a part a part of seeing humans get better and grow. Like that was just, that was something, it, it's not a glamorous job. It's not high paid, but I was like, I don't care. My dad always told me, he said, do what you love. He goes, it doesn't matter how much it pays. I mean, within reason, I mean, you got to be able to pay for a house, a roof, food. I think we all understand that, but he said, do what you love. So I was like, I want to teach and coach because that's what I love. I love uh, relationships. I love building relationships and I love <clears throat> seeing people grow. So that's, that's the why. Um, some of the people that I uh, learned some amazing things from, gosh, I mean, there's, there's a lot, but I would say as far as leading a group of people to get to a place, um, I would say, obviously I played under one of the best coaches ever in Bill Belichick and he, he may have, he may not have checked all the boxes that I'd like to be checked, <clears throat> but he did work his tail off. He did. He was a great leader. Like he led by example. He worked harder than any other person in the building. So like, I respected that and he kept people accountable. And he checked so, the most important boxes. <clears throat> yes. Now, did he check all of them? No. There were some other leaders that I was around that uh, probably checked some other boxes better, but they didn't have all the other ones. Like mm -hmm. Bill probably had the most important boxes checked, mm -hmm. at least most of the most important. And that's why I think <clears throat> he was so incredible at what he, at what he did. The, the reason it, you, you also asked like, Hey, wh what would you have done? say if I was a, a head, not a head coach, maybe a head coach, a teacher, um, <clears throat> I would, I would spend all my time making sure whether it's because I was going to be a math teacher, making sure my students had all the information they needed, all the information they needed. And I'm not, I wouldn't have been one of those teachers that would have said, <clears throat> all right, this is, this is going to be over this chapter. No, I'm letting them know. I don't need them to go out and do guesswork. I'm going to say, hey, this is, this is what's important. This is what we need to know. I'm giving them all the info that's going to be on the tests, that's going to be learned. Because it's not about being a hard teacher and being like, see, it's tough to get an A in here. I think that's stupid. I think that's really dumb. Let's maybe teach and go over all the info that's important because if kids have to go out and search for it, I mean, that's not, you're not teaching. There, there's nothing about that's teaching. If, if you're talking, even, even if you're a professional football coach, it's like, well, oh, they can look in the playbook. No, like maybe teach them every play mm -hmm. because that's what a, that's what a good teacher does. 
So number one, I'm giving them all the info. All the info that they need. Next, I, even if you're a teacher, whatever, I'm going to lead them. And it kind of goes into giving them all the info. I'm going to lead them. And the type of leadership that I believe in is servant leadership. So the way I would serve them is I'm going to give them all the info that they need. Like, that's important. If you're the teacher, your job is to give them the info. And could it be as a certain? Yes. I'm not saying, hey, you go get me the info because that's not teaching. Unless you're teaching a uh, guess and find class. Never heard of a guess and find class. But say I was teaching a guess and find class, it would probably be like, okay, go look in your textbook and guess and find what I'm going to talk about. But that's not teaching. That's just some fake class. So I would try to lead in that way. And then I put like, <clears throat> love your guys. Like say it's a football team or just love your students. <clears throat> what does love your students mean? What does love your guys mean? Oh, that you're, you care about them. And you care about more than just how they are as a math student or how they are as a football player. A lot of people get this wrong, I believe. I think they do a terrible, some people do a terrible job of that. Um, then there's some people who do a great job. But the people that I remember in my years are the people that actually cared about my family, cared about my kids. How are your kids doing? Well, that matters because I feel much more comfortable around you if you actually care more about me than just football. And what happens when that happens, at least in football, is, man, like, I'm going to play even harder for this guy because, I mean, I'm playing hard regardless. But if someone cares about me, I want to make that person look better. I really do. And I, th I think it still goes hand in hand for teach like teachers too. Like if you literally care, it's like, oh, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to maybe pay attention or listen a little bit better. And that's, what's, that's, what's huge to me is I give them all the info you need, lead like a servant, love your people. And then also this is where I think some people get tripped up. And that's just keeping, keeping people accountable because not a lot of people, and I don't know if it's the day and age we're in, but people are terrified of conflict, which makes no sense to me because if you're going to have a healthy relationship, well, like com just conflict is hard and people don't like doing hard things anymore. Right. And, but, but like relationships, the best relationships in your life, Slaw or Scott, it's, you have conflict because the best relationships work out the conflict. But if you're not willing to do that, you're actually saying you don't care about that relationship. So if I, accurate. if I can't keep my students, like I'm teaching accountable, I don't, do I really care about them? No, I don't. If I can't tell um, Peggy Sue, that she got this wrong because she did this, this, and this, because I just don't care about her. Or if I'm not willing to put in the time to tell her why she, even if she struggles with it, it's like, no, I'm, I need to put in the time to keep her accountable on her deal, on, on her, like, on the problem. Or like in football, if you don't keep someone accountable on, their ME's mental errors, you don't really care about them. You just don't. And that's what I respected about the greatest coaches I ever played with is they weren't afraid to keep me accountable. They weren't afraid to, I don't want to say discipline me, but I mean, <clears throat> but yeah, I guess this, because then, you know, they actually care. Well, I think it's more so just about the accountability. Yeah, but I'm saying you get disciplined when yeah. kept accountable a lot of times. Like in New England, if you had a penalty, you're running a lap. And it's like people are like, oh, my gosh, it's so hard. I don't want to run a lap. Well, don't, don't have a penalty. 
Mm -hmm. He actually cares about me because he's saying don't have penalties. So I don't know. That's I kind of went on and on, but those are like four things that like I think are super important. If you're going to lead, if you're going to teach, if you're going to coach, lead, teaching, coaching all kind of go hand in hand. I think yeah. the number one thing is, I mean, there are four things, but it's, it's all like, if you, if you do all four of these things, <clears throat> you're probably going to have a pretty good relationship with that human being. And well, it's a relationship. Let's world. lay it out here for, for the listeners here. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a coach No. to do this. If you're a parent, you need to do this. Parents are the ultimate teachers. Your whole job, I mean, your primary job is to keep your child alive. But then after that, it's, it's to teach them. Mm -hmm. To teach them how to be a good human being and a successful human being. They can't be either of those unless you teach them. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing better than seeing a kid's face light up when, when, when you have taught them and you've challenged them and you've given them a task and they went out and they were successful. Yeah kids just beam from that and yeah that is so gratifying as a te teacher as a coach as a parent uh, i mean if you have a heart right well yeah yeah and and as far as con conflict goes uh you know you were talking about conflict in in relationships uh my wife and i talk about it all the time in my family growing up we were not allowed to have conflict mm. there was nothing discussed and guess what happened? I don't have a family anymore. Uh, because bad things happen when you operate like that. Uh, so since coming home, I mean, we've had conflicts with a few, a few people. And what do I do? I handle it immediately. Yeah. Woody, you and I have had con con conflict. Yeah. And, and, you know, my wife has asked me, she's like, well, well, I mean, what are you going to do? And I said, I, I got to call him. I got to yeah. call him. I have yeah. to. And she's like, well, just, just be, just be easy, relax. I'm like, no, no, I can't. Because my relationship with him is very important. If mm -hmm. I don't let him know that something upset me and, and, and we, and how we need to work, work through it. I mean, with, with, uh, with my brother-in-law, I've had a whole bunch of conflicts with him. And I go chew his ass. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because I care about that relationship. If I don't chew ass, guess what? My relationship is done with him. Yeah. It's and done. you just don't, and you don't care about your, that relationship. Yeah. At all. It isn't fun. It isn't fun to go have that conversation, but your relationship is instantly better. And I think the thing you said, it's not fun. It's because I guess we just don't do this stuff anymore, but there's a, there's a, there's vulnerability and um also like you could hurt someone's feelings is what some people would say it's like well if you establish that in your relationship long before that you're not worried about that because you know the other person will be okay with it and that's what a real relationship is is something that you can you can keep people accountable you can um you can talk about things that make some people super uncomfortable like different things that conflict if something comes up like if like you said it's happened with us it's because like we care about each other if right. i didn't care about you i probably just wouldn't say anything You're like all right moving on right you know and the, and that's the thing is it's like but it eats at you if there's something that bothers you have to call that person i mean if there's something that bothers you about your child then talk to them about it I know it's crazy. It's this human interaction that we call communication. And if you don't have it, things are going to go haywire. Mm -hmm. Then we're Scott, not human, human beings anymore. Yeah. Scotty, what do you have, bro? Like, is there any questions you have? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think you just got people got to learn how to fight, not fight. You know what I mean? Like people need to learn how to argue mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing yeah. here. Um, and you know, something, when you were talking, it just made me reflect and like, this one will always stay with me. My dad, you know, he always said, 
when you want to hear something, you go to your mom. When you need to hear something, you come to me. And yeah. they had they had split the love and accountability, right? Like yep. mom was there for the love. And I'm not saying she babied me. And I'm not saying I have any family problem. I don't have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I was blessed to, with my family. But there's something to that that is that that balance of love and accountability. And I just don't think people know how to do that correctly, including, I mean, it's a learning progress, even for me with some things too. Right. Yeah. Well, and they're both so important. The love is extremely important to nurture a kid, but it goes hand in hand. And that's what people are forgetting because they just want to do the love because the love is the fun stuff. It's easy, man, but it's the like, worst it's, thing you can do sick. over time. It's just proven. Oh, how many rich kids growing up? Do you know that are alive? Number one, or I'm um, seriously are alive no, I, right? Or, or just not just so lost. Mm -hmm. oh, Show yeah, me one rich kid that had everything growing up in your high school, grade school, whatever that is. And, and like, what are they doing now? Mm -hmm. Well, and the, and the thing is that people don't understand because love looks like so many different things. Some people are like, it's, Oh, it's just talking. Nice. Not accountability is love. Hmm. Yeah, you know, like yeah, like accountability is love. Like 100%. my dad kept me accountable on everything. And there were times I hated it growing up. But dang, he's one of my best friends now. And I love my dad more than anything. And and I think that's that's something for me as a dad, is it's like, you know parenting it's not always your job to be their best friend especially as they're growing up it's to be their dad and sometimes it's not fun because they're not really happy with you well guess what when they're 22 23 years old they're gonna love you way more than if you just let them get away with things they're gonna be like man the reason i how i am today is because of him or because of her if it's your mom because there's some people that just they have a, maybe a single mom or whatever, or a, or a dad alone. And it's like, you're not always going to like them. There are plenty of times I did not like my mom and dad, but I'll tell you what, now outside of my wife, they're like my best friends. And I think that's, some, I think I, I've had a great example in them. They knew how to do the hard things in, in being mom and dad and building our relationships. And I, I mean, gosh dang they're reaping the rewards with their kids now well and i think uh another way you can look at it is look at what's happened in our country or our world when it comes to failed marriages mm. um you know accountability well i guess accountability isn't the right word when talking about marriage but but communication learning yeah. how to do the hard things yeah there's very few things in this world that, that is harder than, than marriage. And, and, you know, I say that kind of, kind of tongue in cheek because marriage can also be very easy once you figure it out, once you mm -hmm. figure out the communication aspect. Hey, and that's it, slaw brings up a great point that I forgot on my whole communications. I mean, it's within a lot of that. That's probably within accountability, but that's like up there with like, any of those, but go ahead, Slaw, because communicate. That's how you resolve anything. That's how you lead. Right. That's how you love your people. But right. go ahead, Slaw. Sorry about that. Yeah, nobody likes fighting with their wife, or or for if if we do have a female listener or two with their husbands. Um, eight, to eight, uh, sixteen or seventeen guys, and then like two or three. <laughs> yeah, wives. Your wives. Yeah, nobody enjoys. No, well. our wives think we're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I guess uh, maybe sociopaths like like arguing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 isn't fun. It isn't fun to to have a heated discussion with your wife. Um, but it's very important because the second you pull that punch, uh, well, okay, he's not talking you know, about actually yeah. punching. Yeah, but just just so verbal, just so we're clear. verbal punch. Yeah, where you decide, ah, it's not that big of a deal. Just let it go. And then the next time, because you're, you're now building a habit. Well, I was upset 
Ah, but I really don't feel like getting into a getting into an argument. So ah, I'm not going to say anything. Well, then you pulled another one. Then you pulled another one. It's a habit then. Pretty soon the relationship is over and you're filing for a divorce. Yep. Because you have to, I, I mean, you and your wife are partners in life and you're two different people, two different minds. If, if you don't get on the same page, working towards the same goals in parenting and in life and careers and whatever it is, if you don't have the same direction going, you, you, you can't have the same mind. It isn't possible. Uh, but you have to be everything you're doing. You have to be working together and things are gonna, are gonna get a little screwy and off the rails. And if you don't get it back on the rails quick, things are about to get a hell of a lot harder. And the only way to get, get the train back on the rails is a little bit of conflict. Hey, so it went from teaching, which is great to how we talk about communication to your relationship with your wife or your, I guess your husband. Well, and in figure, marriage. Fig, yes. Figure it out to anyone listening. <laughs> and you're not talking to them, talking to your wife or husband, figure it out. Take, uh, go as, as someone says, go low on it. And that means like you take the blame and figure it out, but go talk. Absolutely. Gather around. Gather around, right, children. Kids. Oh, children. <laughs> hey. All right, kids. Hey, hey, can I can I say it? Yeah, go ahead. Gather around, children. Come talk to Mr. Slauson. Uh, I don't want to say Mr. Story time with Slauson. Gather around, kids. All right. Sit down, shut up, get on the damn rug. All right. So, uh, yeah, so I want to tell a story. About my career when my career shifted and in a way it got harder but in a lot of other ways it got a hell of a lot easier um i i believe i've told this story before on our podcast tell it again i can't early, wait the kids haven't heard early in my career when i was playing for the new york jets um there was there was some dark dark times there where the organization felt that it was okay to mess around with me they were uh uh you know the gm and i the gm uh mike tannen clown uh we didn't see eye to eye he didn't like me because because i was a success story i was an underdog success story and he wanted nothing to do with that because what he wanted was he wanted the high profile story that he was responsible for. Well, Tannenbaum fucked up right out of the gate and absolved himself of any responsibility of me when they drafted me. Uh, I don't know why he chose to do that um, because any success I would have would actively work against him. And that's exactly what, what happened. I took over uh, for, a, for a hall of famer. Um, and there wasn't really a drop-off in our production on the offensive line. So right there, there was success and that, and that made him look bad. So, uh, so he drafted a guy, a super freak, awesome dude, Vladimir Dukas. Um, he, uh, and, and, you know, I don't shy away from, confrontation i don't shy away from competition so uh uh i made sure vladimir and i were on the same page that we were going to help each other and the best guy was going to get the job and we were going to do what was best for the team because ultimately we all win uh i was going to win vladimir was going to win as long as our team won so let's work together on this help each other out make each other better and he pushed me and I pushed him, but ultimately it was my, my job every year. And uh, as the years kept going by, that made the GM angrier and angrier that I continued to, to hold the starting position and we continued to have success. Uh, so he put me in a position where uh, they started taking money away from me, um, making things a lot more difficult. 
so again, I won't get into all the ins and outs, but one day I snapped, uh, I snapped, I threatened, I threatened the life of my offensive line coach. Who's actually a really, a really good, good friend of mine. Now, uh, I threatened, you don't him. need, to, you don't need to share his name, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Him and I are, are really close. Um, I respect him a lot. He respects me. Uh, but on that day I lost it because I, I had a, a decision to make. Was this in I, like in the building or was it on the field? Uh, so he, he snapped on me in front of the entire team in the building. Oh, and, uh, you're and, the last guy I'd snap on. I think though. Well, at that time, things like, were like that very, very <laughs> different. So the reason I'm telling this story is because we had a text message thread going on where we we're all joking around with each other. And our new head of marketing, our marketing czar, Dallin Yo, um, uh, Yo. said said something uh, in in that he is always, always angry. He's going through life angry, uh, stays angry. And that got me thinking about this, about this story, reflecting back on the events in your life that change you, but also make you who you are. Uh, this was one of those big events in my life because before that I was just a happy go lucky kid, just, you know, uh, going through, through my career, uh, life was just happening to me. I wasn't happening to life. Uh, things, things were happening pr pretty well. Uh, but I was definitely living on borrowed time because I didn't have the right mentality uh, to really have a prolonged uh, successful run in the NFL. I, I believe had this event not happened, I would have been out of the league much earlier. Because um, on that day, I figured out when I snapped on that coach and I threatened his life in front of thousands of fans in the middle of the football field, I saw a dramatic shift in how the organization treated me. Uh, so now I had to, I, I had to carry that on. I believed I had to continue that, uh, that facade, that, that mask that I've been the angry person, day. the angry person, <laughs> the psycho, um, the guy that nobody wanted to mess with. Uh, so I started taking it harder and harder where I would start doing ridiculous stuff. Every time I saw the GM, I'd put my middle finger in his face and tell <laughs> and, and I'd tell him to go fuck himself. Did you verbalize that? 100%. Every time I saw Mike Tannenbaum after what, <laughs> what did he do? I I thought I told you this this the story. I can't remember. No, I, I oh. you you've told uh, you've kind of, I don't no, know. I was going to say not I don't shared think this gem. What do you you haven't shared okay. this with me, but I can't remember what he did. Okay. I knew you well, did the middle finger yeah. thing. I couldn't remember if you like said the words. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, uh, after every game, Mike Tannenbaum would stand by the locker room door and shake every player's hand when they would walk in. Um, and occasionally he would be out at practice at the end of practice, just to say hello to the guys. Um, but again, he, he was fucking around with me. He knew he couldn't go after anybody else on the line because they were all first round draft picks, majority of them, future hall of famers, all of them, all pros. Um, I, I was, and then the there other. was slaw. I was the other and they were it. They, they were in a tough spot where they needed money. And let's be honest. I was a, I was a six round pick on my rookie deal. I'm not mm -hmm. making money. No, no. I'm, I'm making really good money, but, but you're not making grand, like salary. In grand scheme of salary cap i equated to nothing i i would say less than half a percent yeah there's, there's 53 guys on a team i equated to less than half of one percent and they decided they were going to take some money away from me uh but but i knew what the whole deal was about he was trying to get me out because the deal was you accept the pay cut and you keep your job or we trade you to Dallas where Bill Callahan wants you. I knew what they were doing. They were trying to get me out and they were trying to make me the reason for getting out so they could start Vladimir. 
And Vladimir is an awesome dude. Yeah, nice guy. It's, it has nothing to do with Vladimir. Awesome dude. But no offense to him. You were just a better player. And that's okay. I, I could run rush rough shot over him on the football field. The dude was one of the biggest freaks I've ever met in my life. But I could play football. And um anyways, Mike, Mike, Mike Tannenbaum, Tannenbaum he'd Mike be Tannenbaum was putting games. me in a position to make me look selfish and make me look like I'm chasing the dollar. So I would just get out of his hair. So Bro, he would have no other choice. The kids are wondering what would happen when you'd walk in after games, after you guys win a game and he'd be there shaking hands. The kids want to know. Yeah. So, uh, children. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's James a gesture you can make. It. There's a gesture you can make with your middle finger that has another meaning. You'll learn it when you get older. So I would stick that finger in his face and I would say, go fudge yourself. Oh, go fudge yourself. And that went on a couple of weeks. And then he called me into his office one time and said, you can't, you can't do this. You can't do this to me in front of the team, in front of the guys. I said, well, Mike, you say? I keep telling you to go, to go fuck off. And you have yet to go fuck off. So when you go fuck off, then I'll stop doing it. <laughs> He's like, what is this about? What's it about? So what is this about? Oh. You, you, you did this, you staged this whole political move here to take a million dollars away from, or half a million dollars away from me. And what did that do for you? Nothing, but it completely tore my whole life up because right after that, that happened when I agreed to the deal, the competition was closed. I was the starting guard. My salary then became guaranteed. And I said, okay, good, good, good. But I have my own demand here and that I am the guy. I am the guy. I'm done with this whole competition thing. As long as I'm here, I am the left guard and that is it. And, and he agreed to that. When the season came, I am now in a contract year and I'm planning on getting the hell out of Dodge when this season's over. I'm going to have the season of my life and get the hell out of there and go and go and get paid. Well, the second game comes and all of a sudden I'm being rotated for, I'm playing three series. Vlad's playing one. That's not smart. There's no offensive line that, that does that mm -mm. because it doesn't work because the timing uh, needs to match up with everybody. Now, sure. If somebody gets hurt, then yeah, yeah. You, you put in the backup and away you go. But the GM was so sick and tired of, of not having his guy in there that finally when Bill Callahan left and went to Dallas, uh, they brought in a guy that was very young in his career. So then Mike could call the shots. So Mike essentially said, enough of this. I can't justify pulling Slauson from his starting job because he is the best. And now I just agreed to terms that he's the starter. Uh, but I can rotate him. Tell the, tell, what, and you know tell the kids gonna how that went. That's going to, that's going to fuck up his whole free agency. So right then is when I decided to change that. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be looking for fights anytime I can. I'm going to be looking for a fight and I'm not pulling any punch. I'm taking every single opportunity. Well, it was difficult to put on, on that, that mask and play that character every day. I felt like I was in the WWE at that point where I'm just putting on a freaking show every day. Was it kind of fun? It was or, fun, but it was also exhausting. I was going to say it was very exhausting too. So then when that year's over and I leave <clears throat> in free agency and I go to the Bears, um, I was kind of excited to be able to reset a little bit and just play football and get back to being who I was. Uh, well, one of our coaches from the jets also came over to the bears. And when they signed me in free agency, apparently he let everybody know <laughs> what I was about because instantly when I came in, everybody's walking on eggshells. I'm like, what is going on? So I found that coach. I'm like, what happened? 
He goes, oh, yeah, I let everybody know. I let everybody know. They better they better be careful around you. It's like, shit, son of a bitch. I have and, to do this again. And we, we, we were in a full offensive line re, rebuild um, that we only had one single player from – from from the previous uh from the previous team on that line the rest we had a new left tackle we had me who was new to the team our center was the same and then we drafted kyle long in the first round and jordan mills in the third or fourth round i can't remember um so we had four out of five new new guys on the o-line and i was tasked with helping the rebuild the Bears O line before that was not good. They were like 30th, 31st, 32nd, 29th. That those were the rankings like the previous four, four years before I got there. After that year, we we finished number three. Um, now I'm not saying I had everything to do with that. Obviously, four of the five pieces are new, so everybody had a hand in that. But I was told the expectation was for me to be that type of guy. So again, I'm looking for fights. Kyle Long is a rookie. Jordan Mills is a rookie. They have no idea what they're doing. And I, and, and I came from one of the, the most established offensive line in the league at the Jets to a brand new offensive line when they're saying, how can we make the, these guys like that? Slauson, you were there. You know what it takes. So you show these guys how to do it. So I got angry. I got angry again, started looking for fights. Now, a guy like Kyle Long, I didn't have to poke and prod him a whole hell of a lot to get him to fight. Kyle loves to fight. Uh, so that worked out really well. Uh, well, fast, fast forward uh, three, three, three years, you know, and then I leave and I come join you out in San Diego there. What does old GM Tom Telesco tell me? I need you to be a psycho because this offensive line is full of a bunch of pussies. This is the conversation this man had with me. I was excited. I am now in the twilight of my career and I'm going sweet. Now I get to go out to Southern Cali, get back with Woody, just kind of relax. I got a hall of fame quarterback. It's going to be pretty nice. And the GM says, this whole line's full of a bunch of pussies. I need you to be a psycho. I said, well, shit, here we go again. I've gotten pretty good at this. So let's get angry. So anyway, in a nutshell, it is hard to go through life angry. You are adding more weight on you. You're adding more stress in your life. But there's also some, something to be said about that because uh, the whole notion of fake it till you make it. And I explain, uh, you know, if a lot of my career, I was not confident. So I had to almost fake, fake the confidence, do the Muhammad Ali self-talk type of deal where you, where you just tell yourself over and over that you are the best, you are the greatest, uh, fake confidence will breed real confidence eventually. And when I was angry, you know, we we've had some studs uh, that I've played with throughout my career. I mean, uh, when you're talking about the Jets, the uh, uh, oh my gosh, there was so many studs at the Jets: Sione Buha and uh, Mike, he, he, Mike DeVito, Mike DeVito, Chris Jenkins, Cal, uh, Calvin Pace. Um, Just a lot of really good players. Yeah, a lot of studs. Now on the Bears. Uh, you know, Jeremiah Rat Ratliff, he was a psychopath, Julius Peppers, Lance Briggs, a lot of these guys that I'm practicing against every day that are super freaks. Th this is who I have to battle against every day. So obviously, it's pretty easy to have your confidence shaken. And then you're going to go into go into a game uh, without any confidence, you have zero success. It, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be a a scared little boy in the corner pissing himself ain't gonna work you hear that kids you don't want to pee your pants yeah so what i figured out by by getting angry and staying angry and looking for a fight is it it didn't make me scared of a julius peppers of a jeremiah ratliff i wasn't scared 
I was angry and I was waiting to snap on one of them all week long. I'm just like, please, one of you guys fuck with me, please, please fuck with me. So in your kindergarten class, kids. <laughs> yeah. So obviously this talk is not for children, but. But you're here, uh, kids. I mean. <laughs> uh, then when right, I right. go to the game, when I go Reggie, to the game, be because careful. I was just practicing all week against Julius Peppers and Jeremiah Ratliff and Henry Melton, all these guys, I knew going into the game, I wasn't going to see anything better than what I just saw all week until I played Aaron Donald. Uh, then that was something else. But, uh, but yeah, so I guess, in a nut, nut, Aaron. I guess in a nutshell, what I'm saying is, is uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend being, being angry, going through life angry, but it's also okay to do that if if you find that it works for you and it doesn't necessarily have to be angry it can be any and any, any emotion that just you got to find what works for you to unlock your mind to unlock your emotion your passion whatever it is to help make you successful and in my career i i i kind of was tasked to be a certain type of guy to help rebuild and to help lead so <clears throat> that was the way i saw fit to do it and if if there was an issue i was having with a guy guess what you're getting angry slaw really angry slaw and and it helped me in the o-line rooms because it it bred accountability slaw because I th guys didn't want to hear it out of me i think i think uh i think gabe has a question <laughs> mr slawson so if I disagree with my teacher, do I fight him? Good question, Gabe. Yeah, great, great question. Well, Gabe, uh, I don't recommend it. For me, it worked out great. But it might work for Gabe, right? I mean, it might. It might. I think uh, being an NFL offensive lineman is a little different than sitting in your homeroom. Class. It's more so once you're a little older, Gabe. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's okay to not take shit off people. Telling when, you, we got to write kid, this book. When, when, <laughs> when you're a kid, when you're a kid, get used to taking a lot of shit. Okay. But it's when okay. you're older, when you're older, and that's what sparked all this off is I thought like, Okay. When you're older, if you're I'm an just, NFL player, I'm just right here. Just, just getting bent over and taken advantage of. And I'm a father now. And one day I'm going to have, have the conversation with my kids. Like you got to stand up for yourself. You got to stand up for what you believe in your convictions, your values, your beliefs, when it, when they are challenged and you cannot be afraid to mm. challenge back. True. And how am I supposed to tell that to them when I am sitting here getting railed? I can't do it. So I said, I need to grow up if I'm going to help my kids grow up and, and let's start being a convicted man myself. So I did. And it worked out great. I, I wouldn't that. recommend to anybody doing it how I did it. No, no. Well, yeah. I, I hope everyone knows that we're not giving advice on how to act. Yes. But well, I, I can <laughs> do that. And my for, advice for is NFL players, my advice is don't do what I did. Yeah. Don't do what he did, but don't be, don't be worried to fight for your position. Just not necessarily in threatening coaches and stuff like that. Yeah. Don't be afraid to fight for anything in life. Gabe's a good football player. Great fourth grader. <laughs> you have to be a man of conviction and be strong in who you are and what you believe. And if you aren't willing to fight, fight for it, then, then you're just going to be a sheep like everybody else. And, uh, and yeah, I'm not here for that. I don't think anyone in this group's here for that. So now I had this whole idea of we're going to write this whole campaign and we're going to write a book called shit linemen do. But now I think we should do, don't do what offensive linemen do. And that should be the title of the book. So I don't know. I don't know which one to do now. Yeah, I, I'm confused. Well, I hey, think kid, we can kids, still do. We can kids, still how many do hands shit, would read it? We can still do shit linemen do. 
just at the very end of the book, right before the end, in bold, we put, don't do this. That's fair. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, that would be, that was one of my more favorite uh, story times. That is incredible. Kids, uh, give Mr. Slauson a hand. Golf clap. 